Here we're going to look at the complex derivative and show that it behaves a lot like the real derivative, in other words, the derivative of a real valued function, but it also differs in what I'll call its niceness uh, to the derivative of a real valued function. And we'll see that via some examples. So let's look at a definition first. So let's say we're given a complex function. So that means its domain is C, really like a subset of C, but we'll just say its domain is C and its codomain is C. So it takes complex numbers as inputs and provides complex numbers as outputs. So we say that it is differentiable or maybe complex differentiable at a point Z if the limit as delta Z goes to zero of F of Z plus delta Z minus F of Z over delta Z exists and is finite. And in the case that this limit exists and is finite, we call it F prime of Z. So just like we do in regular calculus. Another thing that I'd like to notice is that this looks just like the difference quotient from regular calculus, but there's a really important difference here. In regular calculus, what I mean by regular calculus is maybe a single variable real calculus. The delta x, which would be going to zero, can only approach zero from two directions, from above and from below. So in other words, from positive numbers or negative numbers. But since we're in the complex plane, we can approach zero many, many different ways because, like I said, we're in a plane. We can approach it along the real axis or along the imaginary axis or along some sort of crazy curve which is happening in the complex plane. So there's a lot more to check in this case. Um, this is kind of like the limit of a multivariable function, except with some additional structure um, related to this complex number i. Okay, so if you want some more information, I've got a full complex analysis course on the second channel, Math Major. So I think by the time this video is up, most of this course should be up. A great follow-up to watching math YouTube videos is to practice solving math problems on your own. And a great place to do that is with today's sponsor, Brilliant.org. Brilliant has wonderful interactive math, science, and computer science courses at all levels. And when I say all levels, I really mean all levels. So for math, this ranges from basic arithmetic and algebra, geometry, all the way through differential equations, vector calculus, linear algebra, and group theory. Personally, I take inspiration from Brilliant for the courses that I teach at my college. They often have an intuitive yet outside the box approach that students really respond to. Looking at my analytics, I know that I have viewers of all ages, and I think Brilliant would cater to any of you. So if you're still in school, you might enjoy learning math problem solving techniques as they apply to contests. And Brilliant has two courses devoted just to this material. You could also maybe review basic algebra, geometry, and trigonometry, or use Brilliant as a supplement to a calculus course you're taking. Finally, if you're in a position like mine, you might take inspiration from Brilliant for the courses that you're teaching, and maybe to help your kids learn a little bit extra. What are you waiting for? To get started for free, visit brilliant.org slash Michael Penn, or click the link in the description and the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. And one more time, I'd like to thank Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. Okay, so let's look at a couple of examples. So the first example that I wanna look at is what happens if we have f of z equals z squared. So z squared is a fairly simple function, so we should expect this to be differentiable and if anything is right with the world, the derivative should have the same form that it does in real variable calculus. So let's look. So we'll try to calculate f prime of z. So it's a little bit of a cheat to write f prime now because we don't know that the limit will exist and be finite, but you'll see that we'll be okay. So this is the limit as delta z approaches zero of z plus delta z quantity squared minus z squared over delta z. Okay, nice. But now we can do a little bit of simplification in the numerator. So we can multiply that binomial out and we'll see that we get z squared 2z times delta z and delta z squared. So let's write that. We have z squared plus 
2 times z times delta z and then plus delta z squared and then we're subtracting from that z squared because that's our f of z. Then we have a delta z in the denominator. Okay, so now let's perform some simplification. So this z squared here can cancel this z squared here. And then next step, we can factor a delta z out of the numerator and use that factor delta z from the numerator to cancel the one in the denominator. So that'll cancel this, this, and cancel this exponent from a 2 to a 1. Okay, so that's going to leave us with the limit as delta z goes to 0 of 2z plus delta z. But notice, in terms of delta z, z is a constant, so 2z will stay the same, and then we just have delta z going to 0 as delta z goes to 0, so that leaves us with 2z. So it's exactly like the power rule that you would expect. Okay, so let's look at maybe uh, an example that's not quite so nice. The example here would be the complex conjugate function. And I guess I shouldn't have given it away that it's not going to be so nice because on the surface, it seems like this function should be very nice. Almost the simplest thing that you can do a, to a complex number other than just leave it alone is find its complex conjugate. But what we'll see is that this function, in fact, does not have a complex derivative. Okay, so let's try to find its complex derivative via the difference quotient. So this is going to be equal to the limit as delta z goes to zero of, let's see, we'll have z plus delta z bar. So that's like g evaluated at z plus delta z minus z bar over delta z. Okay, nice. But now the complex conjugate is a linear function. So that means if we add two things and then take the conjugate, it's the same thing as taking the conjugate and then adding. But that means I can change this long bar to two just short bars over z and delta z. But doing that allows us to cancel this z bar with this z bar. And then we're left with just the limit as delta z approaches zero of delta z bar over delta z. Okay, nice. But now we want to look at this as we approach zero along the real axis and along the imaginary axis. So I'll break this down into two cases. So our first case will be approaching along the real axis. In other words, this is when delta z equals delta x. And so that means delta y is zero. Like I said, we're approaching along the real axis. Maybe you want to think about a complex plane right here. And then what's going on is we're taking the limit in this case, which I'll maybe underline in pink, as you approach zero along those two lines. Okay, nice. So let's see what that gives us. That's going to give us the limit as delta x goes to zero of... Um, let's see, delta z is equal to delta x, but delta x is real, so when we take the conjugate, we'll just get delta x again. So this is going to be delta x over delta x, which is equal to 1. Okay, nice. Now let's look at the case when we're approaching 0 along the imaginary axis. So that means delta z will be equal to i times delta y. So let's maybe just say that that is going along the imaginary axis. So that's like going here and here. I'll underline that in green so that it matches. Okay, so that's going to give us the limit as delta y goes to 0 of, well now we need to take the conjugate of delta z, but delta z is i times delta y. Delta y is real, so the i part is the only thing contributing to the complexness. If we take the conjugate, we get minus i. So this is going to be minus i delta y over i delta y. But notice that gives us the number negative 1. 
So what we see is that along the real path, we get a limit of one. Along an imaginary path, we get a limit of negative one. So that means we really couldn't write this g prime in the first place because g prime does not exist. And what we would say is that this guy right here is non-differentiable. And so the way I like to think about this is like the complex derivative is quite a bit more finicky than the real derivative. Even a very simple function, like the function that takes z to z bar is not differentiable. Now, if you look at this geometrically, then you'll see that this like really makes sense because what does z bar do? Well, it reflects across the, let's see, the real axis. So any tangent which is pointing up will turn to a tangent pointing down, but that's giving us some sort of non-differentiability or non-smooth change there. Okay, so anyway, uh, this is kind of where I wanted to leave this video. Again, if you're psyched, you can check out a full course in complex analysis on the second channel, and that's a good place to stop.